Okay, welcome guys. Um, this is a workshop on entitled Stress Spelled Backwards is Desserts. And it is about stress management. And specifically, I'm trying to target um, more of students as opposed to some of the other populations that I've talked to about stress management in the past. Um, and so let's see if we can make this bad boy go. So let me cut, can I dim the lights a little bit? Is that okay? Can y'all see a little better? Oh, that's perfect. Is that okay for with you? All right. So my name is Nancy Brake, and I am an, I'm a science instructor. Right now I'm teaching anatomy and physiology primarily um, in college transfer. And why am then is the anatomy and physiology teacher coming in and teaching about stress management? I'm one of those people that is a jack of all trades and a master of none. First of all, my master's degree, um, I got my bachelor's in poultry science at NC State, and my master's was in stress physiology, actually in birds, okay, because animals can be stressed and livestock can be stressed, and we want them healthy, so we want to try to manage their stress. So that kind of started it, so that's the physiology of stress. And then for, um, I taught out here adjunct for a while, but then for eight or nine years, I was the exercise specialist in cardiac rehab here at Sampson Regional Medical Center. We exercised patients that had had, or, or I was responsible for exercising patients and education, educating patients that had had heart attacks, uh, bypass surgeries, had some heart transplants. We did pulmonary patients, all these kinds of things. And one of the things that was required for us to do with cardiac rehab patients was to do relaxation techniques with them at least once a week and teach them a class on stress management. So guess who taught them the class on stress management and did their relaxation? And then thirdly, I've been a yoga instructor for about 10 years. I was exercised probably since 1980, oh, I hate to tell you, 86. I started teaching fitness classes in 1986, started teaching yoga about 10 years ago, and I really want to do subboard yoga. I haven't done it yet, but we know how to relax. And so all that just kind of ties together. And I think maybe it doesn't qualify me, but I'm speaking to you about stress management today. Okay. So when I look at stress management, I'm not really going to talk to you as much about wellness, except that we can see that that's a pretty busy slide. So there's a lot of things going on as far as your wellness is concerned. Um, but we do see stress reduction is included in that group. If that picture is way too busy for you, just wellness in general, um, to uh, make it a little bit more concise, if we think about getting some physical activity, some type of exercise or walking or whatever it is, eat a healthy diet, which to me is a non-processed diet, not McDonald's, not Bojangles. I love my students that leave during break and they go and they come back with Bojangles food. Um, drink enough water, get enough sleep, and then, of course, manage your stress. So I had to kind of look up a little bit more about student stress because, you know, I used to, I used to emphasize stress for these cardiac patients because you know, it, that has been identified as a risk factor for heart disease is your stress. So student stress in 2013, the American Psychological Association found, um, it found that teenagers had passed the 18 to 33 year olds to become the most stressed age group in America. So here we may not all, you know, some of us are in that teenager group, some of us are in that 18 to 33 group, but the teenagers are the most stressed group in America and that 18 to 33 group is the second most stressed group in America. So I think we have most of those, that age group um, as students here at the college. Um, so I wondered, I thought, well, maybe adult learners are more stressed because they're trying to manage um, going to school and financial things and their kids and they've just got, you know, they've got a lot of their work, you know, they're probably working um, more likely than the younger students. But I actually uh, learned that adult learners report moderate to severe stress. However, their life experiences seem to uh, uh, have helped them handle the stress of school and deadlines better. So it's sort of like they've they've matured a little bit and they've learned how to handle stress because they've had more stress in their lives uh, than their younger counterparts. So if we just look at students in America, <clears throat> we see that 90% of them think that good grades are important, but 10% of them care about learning. 
79% of students use a mobile cell device in school. 64% can't get help from their parents. 56% of the students say they're happy on a typical day. So that's good, that's over half, but it's still pretty close to half. 43% say that their parents check in about their grades regularly. <coughs> and those that are reporting stress, 66% of them were girls or women, and 54% of them were boys. So I think we can say that students are stressed. So which student do you want to be? Do you want to be the gal biting her, biting her laptop? or the one sleeping in the library, or the guy who is obviously overwhelmed with this huge textbook he's reading, or do you want to be her that's, that's feeling pretty good about her, her next test and her studies, right? I think I want to be the gal biting the laptop personally, but. So I think in order to manage our stress, the first thing we have to do is understand our stress. And so I get a little sciencey sometimes, and if I get too sciencey, just go, what? And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll leave it, I promise. Because what is Ms. Marco teaches? History, is that right? So most of us are in here from history. But what is stress? <clears throat> it's actually been identified and named, and we're gonna talk about it, but it's the General Adaptation Syndrome, or GAS. So I'm gonna call it GAS from now on. Um, it is a, flight or, a fight or flight response. So that's basically when you get stressed, then your first instinct, you're gonna be, get a big adrenaline rush, and you're gonna either fight something off, that's what your body's gonna do, it's either wanting to fight something or it's gonna wanna run away from it. So that's truly what stress is. It's a very instinctual, basic, um, life-saving, we'll call it a skill or instinct. And so your body's just like, if I want to live, I've got to either fight this off or run away. So you see the guy with the big bear, he's also got his, his bookcase right there. Um, it is a specific response to a nonspecific stressor. So we're going to see that no matter what the stress, whether it's a new job or a test coming up or I'm late for work or the traffic's terrible out there in front of Walmart and it's driving me nuts, no matter what the stressor is, your body's response is going to go through pretty much the same chain of events. Okay? Maybe a little bigger on some than others, but it's going to go through the same set chain of events we'll see that stress can be identified as acute, okay, so like, like it happened fast and now it's over. Or it can become chronic. And when it becomes chronic is when it becomes a problem because that's when it affects our bodies. And then we'll also see that we have what's called eustress, which is good stress, that we need some stress in our life in order to survive. And then we have distress, which is, that's not good stress, that's, that's bad stress. So here's your science. Um, the, general, the gas, general adaptation syndrome, was developed by a man named Hans Selye, who was the father of stress physiology, and he made this theory in 1938. And he is the one who coined the phrase stress and gave it a name, all right? He theorized that stress is a major cause of disease because chronic stress causes long-term chemical changes in your body, and it leads to a lot of chronic diseases and if it doesn't lead to the chronic disease, it will make the, it'll exacerbate them, it'll make them worse, okay? Things like diabetes, a lot of stress can make diabetes a lot worse, or heart disease, things like that. Um, so again, it's a specific response to a nonspecific stressor. He's the guy that identified that. And it has three stages, an alarm stage, which we'll look at, a resistance phase, and then an exhaustion stage. So we really don't want to hit the exhaustion stage, right? And some of us feel like sometimes we're at the exhaustion stage. Yeah. So he said that every stress leaves an indelible scar and the organism pays for its survival after a stressful situation by becoming a little older. So it's important to note, you know, I said I, I did stress physiology in chickens. Um, animals experience stress. People experience stress. Plants experience stress. So all living things, one of the characteristics of living things is that they can respond to a stimulus. And stress is a, is a type of a response to a stimulus. So this is the, these are the stages. And this blue line here, and if you've taken a science class or if you've not, in our bodies we have a state called homeostasis, which means stay in the same, okay? I call it constantly changing to stay the same. As our body changes, we adapt, 
comes up here, we want to bring it back to that, to that steady state. Okay? So in our alarm stage, your body, something happens. Um, we almost have a wreck out in front of Walmart. <gasps> what happens? How do you feel? Scared. Okay, what's, what's your heart rate doing? Yeah, heart rate beats faster. What's your breathing doing? <sighs> you're panting, yeah, and it's like all of a sudden your stomach starts to kind of hurt, and you know, maybe you're even shaking a little bit. That's a big dump of adrenaline, okay, or epinephrine, and that is that alarm state, okay, and so that is that initial boom, oh my God, yeah, and then we kind of settle out. So that's that fight or flight. All right, so as long, so here's homeostasis. At first, oh, it's not so good, but then it becomes exhilarating, okay? So sometimes we like that alarm stage where we're not just ready to fight or run away, we also have more heightened awareness because it's like, oh, what's going on? And we, we become mentally sharp. So some people, you know, adrenaline junkies, you know, like bungee jump and things like that, that's what they're after. They like that adrenaline rush. It makes them feel good. It makes them feel sharp. And so for a while, this is actually a type of eustress. It's a good stress right afterwards. At first, it's like a, <gasps> and then it's like, okay, man, I've, I've got this, and it's a eustress. But then, if our stressor doesn't go away, okay, if our stressor doesn't go away, then our adrenal glands kick in with cortisol, and they're trying to help us survive. They're trying to mobilize glucose and give us food to last for a while, so we go into this this resistance stage where we're trying to manage this stress or whatever the situation is for a long period of time. And then if we get to a point, but we're still doing okay because we're hanging out and we're, we're staying strong and we're, we're surviving and we're resisting, but then if my stores start to run out, then I can actually come to an exhaustion stage. And exhaustion can lead to illness and even to death, okay, if it goes, if it goes long enough. But if I, if I can recover, then I can come back to my homeostatic state. So that's, son, that's Hans Selye's general adaptation syndrome. So we can see that within that, we've got good stress. We have eustress up here. We're okay. We're good. We're good. Whoa, we're in distress. So it's when it becomes chronic that it's a problem. Fight or flight. I'm sorry. Monsters, Inc. is like one of my favorite movies. So Sully's a scary guy, right? Sully's a scary guy. So we're either got to fight. So remember when Boo, she was scared of Randall like through the whole movie. He scared her to death. She avoided him. She whimpered. Sully didn't bother her, but he scared her. And finally, she stood up to her fears, and she jumped on his head, and she beat him with a baseball bat, right? Y'all remember? Bonk, bonk, bonk. And then, so we either fight. She found her, she found her alarm phase. She found her... her sharpness, or we have to run away. And so fight or flight is also, I've read a lot this time, people are using stress physiology as a means to train people for like events. Because when we do it, um, our senses and perception sharpen, time may appear to slow down when we're stressed out. Exercise is a stressor. It's a type of eustress. Um, we start to sweat. Our hormones that are, are released that make our blood sticky, okay? Because if we get cut in this fight, we need to be able to clot and not bleed out. See how it goes back to, to very primitive times? It's just a survival instinct. Now, that could be bad if I'm a heart patient, right? Yikes. Um, digestion stops. You may want to urinate or empty your bowels so you can run faster. So that's why some people, when they get really alarmed, you know, we have, they have accidents. We breathe more rapidly, our heart beats faster, our blood flow to the muscles increases, and so we're ready for And that's why it's not necessarily a bad thing. So if I compare eustress with distress, eustress is controlled flight or fight. It's acute stress, which means that it happens and then it's over. It's good stress. It motivates us. It makes us feel sharper, and it protects us from credible fear, from a real, something we really need to be afraid of. 
as compared to anxiety when we're afraid of something that we really don't need to be afraid of. So distress is uncontrolled resistance phase, is uncontrolled resistance phase, which is the cortisol. It's chronic, it's bad, it's a demotivator. You get so stressed you don't want to do anything anymore, right? It's like, gosh, I don't want to stay for this test. I'm just so overwhelmed. I, I don't want to do anything. I just want to go and watch television. That's good. That's good. I can do that. I can zone out watching television. So you don't study. You don't clean your house. <laughs> All these kinds of things. Don't make out the Excel worksheet for Ms. Uh, Ms. Marco. Um, it results in physical and mental complications, which we'll look at a little more carefully. But things like if you're diabetic, your blood sugar tends to be real high because you've been mobilizing all those sugars so you can survive in the wilderness, right? Um, you become immunosuppressed, which means that your immune system doesn't work as well, so you get sick more easily. Have you ever noticed when you get really, really stressed, you always seem to get something? Yeah, that's because the stress is that cortisol, just like you take cortisone for inflammation and stuff from the doctor, it's immunosuppressive and it suppresses your immune system and you'll get sick more often. It gives you mental complications. It can, it can result in anxiety. It can take it further and result in depression. It can make it harder to learn and harder to recall facts. So instead of, um, instead of being something to make you feel sharper, it makes you feel duller, okay? Um, and then you tend to have overreactions to non-threatening situations, okay? Just, just go off. <laughs> when really it didn't, didn't have to go off, right? Didn't have to go nuts and throw things and kind of felt good for a few minutes and it's like, oh man, I scared the dog. So backing up again, talking about eustress versus distress and then pulling students and learning back into it. And this is where I had to do a little research of my own. You know, they were thinking, well, if students are too stressed, they, you know, learning's just down the tubes, which isn't necessarily so. It depended upon when students were stressed and what we were asking them to do. So the first one, encoding, this is when we're first learning that information, then we're consolidating it in our mind, and then we retrieve it, we have to remember it, and then we have to continue to remember and update that information as we go along. So up here, this is enhanced memory, and this is impaired memory. So if I get stressed, well, if I get stressed right about the time I'm getting ready to study or learn this, this information, then it actually helps me. But if it's a little before that, it hurts me. If it happens just before I'm going to consolidate it, I'm sharper. It's acute stress now, acute stress, not chronic stress. Then it helps me and I remember it better. If I get stressed right before a test, something happens to me, whatever it is, and I'm getting ready to retrieve that information, it's a no-go. And if I'm trying to update that information and I get stressed, then I don't, I don't do well with that either. So it really depends upon when the stress is and, and truly how big the stress is. So we're talking, uh, we're talking acute stress here. And I, I found that kind of interesting because I didn't think that any stress would help me with my studies. Does that make sense? Kind of, sort of? Has anybody experienced anything like that? Do you notice when you get stressed? When do you usually get stressed? Right before test. Right before test, and then does like, and then do you feel like you start taking the test and all your information went away? Yeah. I, um, I had a forum in my class and it said what went good this week, what went bad this week, and I was talking about they had just had a test and a lot of them said, I studied for that test, I thought I was prepared, I sat down to take that test, and I felt like I didn't know anything. Okay, well, boom, you got some test anxiety, got stressed, oop, I'm sorry, I'm over here. I got stressed, and I had test anxiety, and that retrieval just went out the window, okay? Yay. And what they're doing with these guys, what they, test, what they were testing them with, was, were doing games like a memory game, you know, where they'd show them cards and then flip them over and then they'd have to remember where they were. That was, that was how they used to test their memory. This one was just um, looking again at the test anxiety and the retrieval, okay? 
so that we had two groups and one group did not have any stress and these guys who knows maybe they yelled at them or maybe they pushed them to do it at a certain speed um, I know that was one of the tests in cardiac rehab when they were looking at stressed people um, in some of the research they made them do a test or, or a puzzle they made them do a puzzle and they timed it you know it's like you have to do it in a certain time and then they measured their cortisol levels to see how stressed they were from having to do that and they had several different stressors but that was one of them so you can see that the people that were not stressed did much better at their retrieval than the people that were under stress. Yeah, I'll put that over there so I quit doing that. So what stresses us out? So on the left side, or my left, on your left, I have things that um, I think we probably know stress us out, but these are things we might not would expect. So, you know, school stresses us, yeah. Um, tests, especially, or any kind of deadline stresses us more. Work can stress us. So if we add those two together, we have even more stress. Family, you know, if you've got kids or you don't get along with your mom or whatever it is. Relationships, legal affairs, money, your health or your illness. Anyone that has a chronic illness, that's very stressful for them. Or if you're caring for someone that has a chronic illness. Um, your environment. If you're just in a toxic or unhealthy environment and you're just miserable at your job or, or in this room, then that can be stressful. Your living situation, maybe you're not living right where you want to and when you want to. But then things we might not expect are, are a new job. That should be a good thing, right? But you get nervous, yeah. New baby, that should be a good thing, but ooh, what, what do I do with this? Moving, graduation. All of a sudden, I'm not in school anymore. i got to get a job. Ah! Getting married. Exercise. We said that was you stress, right? Participating in an athletic competition. Anybody that's ever played a game or run a race or done anything, um, you, you get butterflies right before you take off. Because it's like, oh gosh, I hope I don't hurt myself. Am I going to make it through this race? Mm -hmm. I want to really win this game really bad. So I think that if we look at it, we can see that between eustress and distress, acute stress and chronic stress, what we really want to do is balance out our stress because we're always going to have stress. That's the important thing to remember if we're going to start talking about managing it is that we can't make it go away. We can only balance it out. So then I started looking for balancing um, analogies. And I wasn't sure whether to include this or not because it's, it's science. Y'all might not like science. But you have an autonomic nervous system. That's your automatic nervous system. That's the one that just does things for you, like makes you sweat, makes your heart beat, makes you breathe, and makes hormones release when you need them, and takes care of your body, and keeps that homeostasis, your internal environment, the same. And your nervous system has what's called a parasympathetic. I think of it like a parachute. It's the rest and digest. It's that guy lying there. He's chill. Okay, and then we have our sympathetic, which is, which is the one that cuts on when we have fight or flight. And so we have to balance those. So if this guy gets too, if he gets too wound up, then the parasympathetic nervous system has to take over and bring him back into balance. Okay, if we get too lax and too bleh, then the sympathetic nervous system is going to have to come back in and balance us out. So we've got a system of checks and balances in our body. And I'm going to show you how to turn off this sympathetic nervous system in just a little bit. Maybe not turn it all the way off, but turn it down a bit, okay? That's what you want to do. Because when you get in there and you have that test anxiety, that's your sympathetic nervous system. Ah! I hope this is photoshopped. <laughs> I'd hate to think of this cute little girl playing with this big old grizzly bear. Um, as opposed to managing our stress, I propose that we control our stress, okay? and tame it like we would a wild animal. Because we can't make stress disappear. Somebody's always gonna get sick, or somebody's gonna die, or somebody's gonna treat us bad, or we're gonna have a test, or there's gonna be traffic, or something's always going to be happening. So what we have to learn to do is to react to it differently. So I can remember back in the day when I was doing this for cardiac rehab and we had this video, and there was this guy that comes out of, out of his apartment, he's in New York or something, it's snow and it's cold, you can tell he's cold, and 
he's got a flat tire and he gets mad and he throws his hat and he yells and he screams and he kicks the tire and he probably hurts his foot. He does all these horrible things and he's just having a fit. Okay, is his tire still flat? Yeah. It's probably taking him longer to change it because he had to pitch a hissy fit and now he's got to calm back down, right? Okay, so in the next, and his heart rate's going and all these things. So the next, the next one, he comes along and he looks at it and he goes, and he takes a big deep breath and he goes, because all he can really do is change the tire. And he goes and he opens up his trunk and he gets out the tire iron and he changes his tire. So we have to change the way we react to stress. If we didn't have stress, then we would be dead. Okay? There's always going to be stress in our lives. So the absence of stress, I had one professor would tell me that. He said, what's the absence of stress? And we'd say, death. And he'd say, that's right. Okay. So our reaction to stress is what's important. We want to do as much to balance, though, as to eliminate our distress and to utilize our eustress to our advantage. So we want to, to minimize the distress, which is the chronic stress, and utilize the eustress to our advantage. So if we can dial back that test anxiety just a little bit, then we'll be good. And I, I said, don't just manage your stress, embrace it. I put this up here because my son is a jiu-jitsu guy. And you would think that when some big guy is up on top of you, and you're on the ground, especially if you're used to wrestling, it's, but it's not wrestling, that you would be not in a good place, right? They like to be down there. They just relax and chill and they just calm. And, and jiu-jitsu is all about this staying chill and not freaking out. And you work this and you work that. Before you know it, you're up on top of him and you got his arm in some kind of funky arm bar and he's going. And you're like, yes, I win. So he controlled his stress. So things to do to control or manage our stress. I like dogs too. Physical activity. Get stressed, go take a walk. Okay? Even if it's cold outside, we got enough hallways around here that you can take walks around hallways and go through a, go through a walkway and then come back and go around a hallway. Just say, I'm going to take that 10 minutes, 5 minutes, and I'm just going to move. Okay? You'll breathe. You'll oxygenate. You'll feel better. Eat a healthy diet. If we're eating junk, we just don't feel good and we don't function as well. Okay? Everybody goes, I know. Sleep. How many hours? Did, how many hours? Oh, let's just raise hands. How many people say they sleep um, less than five hours a day? Good. Less than seven hours a day. Less than nine hours a day. How many people sleep more than 10 hours a day? That's some people not voting in here. <laughs> so adults really, shoot, I shoot for at least seven. I don't always get it, but that's like my minimum. But teenagers and young adults is really supposed to be more like nine hours. Okay, and if you don't sleep, you don't function as well. You're, you definitely aren't as clear. So instead of studying one more time, go to sleep. You know, and you may wake up in the morning feeling more refreshed and have time to look over it again then. Self-care. Take time to eat well, take your vitamins, chill, drink your coffee on the porch, whatever it is, take time to do something for you. Go to a yoga class, whatever it is, do something nice for yourself, something you like to do, okay? There's got to be something you like to do. Manage your time. I am the queen of not managing my time. I spend way more time doing stuff than... I need to do, but if you can figure out a way to manage your time, um, study all during the week instead of waiting until right before the test, um, making notes for yourself so that you can check things off. Avoid negative chatter. I had a big discussion with a psychologist on the way to Europe this summer because negative chatter, I can't do this test. I'm just not understanding. I'm going to fail it. You know, if you tell yourself that enough, then you'll start to believe it and your negativeness will, will get even worse. Another cardiac rehab meeting. He was the chaplain of Presbyterian in Charlotte, and he was talking about positive thinking. And he's in here in a room with a bunch of nurses, but a bunch of exercise specialists, and we are a lively bunch. 
usually pretty happy, pretty, pretty talkative, pretty chatty. And he brings up this, um, this woman and he gets her to, here, you, you want to be my illustration? Okay, I'm going to push down on your hand and I want you to push up against me. Push up against me. Push, 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 push hard. Push hard, push hard. Okay, do you see that? All right, now I want you to say, I am weak. 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 Keep saying it. I am weak. 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 All right, press against my hand. God, I hope this works. Press. Now say, I'm strong, I'm strong, I'm strong. I'm strong. And go back. <laughs> go back. Yeah, you can go back. But you got you to, gotta, so that's the negativity. It is a real thing. Is that not wild? I mean, that really, could you tell? Did you start to feel like, I'm weak? Yeah. God, I'm stupid. I'm stupid. I can't do this. I'm stupid. Don't say that stuff. Learn to say no if somebody asks you to do something like make an Excel sheet and you, and you know you probably won't get to it. But you say, yeah, sure, I'll do that. Avoid procrastination. I am the worst. Tell me this, if you've got two classes and one you're doing really well in and one you're not doing so well in, which one do you study first? The, that's me. I'm procrastinating because I don't want to study the one that I don't know as well. Because it's harder, it's not as much fun, right? And then don't judge yourself, you know? Don't, don't label yourself as... as Something not so great. This is a friend of mine. I'm looking for balanced things. This is a very this is a harder pose than it would look like. It's called a poet's pose. And so in managing your stress or controlling your stress, there's some relaxation techniques we're going to use today. We can use meditation. Meditation does not mean that I have to sit on the floor and go home, although sometimes I do. Meditation can be sitting and just telling yourself, I am strong, I am strong or I am going to pass this test. I am going to pass this test. I know this stuff. Coloring, adult coloring is very popular now. And I actually like the little bookmarks. I color on them before I go to sleep at night. Um, stroking a cat or a dog, anything that is very repetitive and you don't have to think about can be meditative because you really just want to empty your mind when you're meditating. And every time we have what's called a monkey mind, means that things pop in it's like, yeah, Miss Brake's saying relax, but you know, I'm thinking about that test that I have tomorrow, and then I'm thinking, oh, I got to go home, and I need to go to the grocery store. That's that's our chatter in our head, and so what we want to do is try to eliminate the chatter. Um, washing a car, one-word prayers. There's all kinds of different things. Yoga can be good. Of course, I'm going to throw yoga in there. I traveled with someone that did was a hypnotist, not like a you know, on the stage hypnotist, but she actually uses hypnotism to help people through depression and anxiety. It's more of a practice than a, I'm going to hypnotize you and you're not going to be depressed anymore. All right. Soothing music, positive thinking. Say good things about yourself. School-wise, think about getting yourself more organized, managing your time, prioritizing. I'm not good at that either. Don't procrastinate. We already said it. Journal. Sometimes a journal will help you identify the things that stress you out. Um, review your material daily. Avoid the blame game. Okay? It's that teacher's fault for giving me that test. Da -da 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 -da. It's so-and-so's fault. He got in my way today and he got me upset and then I couldn't study. What, you know, whatever. No blame games. These are just pictures of coloring things. So maybe you like coloring stuff and you want to color something that says, okay, remind myself to breathe. Remind, today's going to be awesome. You can Google free coloring pages online, and these things will come up like crazy, okay? All kinds of them. You can just download them, print them off, and color. And then, guys, you, probably, you might not like breathe, and today is going to be awesome. So you can do um, Stormtroopers. Sent this one to that son that's the jiu-jitsu guy because he's, he's also a Star Wars geek. Or just, you know, kind of random you know, patterns and things like that. But slowing down, um, last semester I did a lot of coloring pages for anatomy. And one student's comment was, I really like them because they make me slow down and think about the material. Voila! I was like, yay me! I thought of something good. So last time, balance, balance, balance. Do we want to be this guy 
or do we want to be this guy? Or maybe I want to be my friend Jennifer who can pop out a crow anywhere, anytime. Yeah, she's pretty awesome. And just think that if you can manage your stress and create balance, all the awesome things that you can do. Okay? So let's think about some stuff that we can do today. What time is it? Let's just see if we can relax a little bit and maybe get a little bit of positive thinking going on. What you think? Good. Do you like that picture? I'll leave that picture up there? Okay. Let's see if I can find some music. Now there's a couple of ways. You may think I'm crazy. A lot, of my, a lot of my students think I am. I prefer eccentric. So sometimes when we do yoga, we breathe and we move at the same time. Yoga means to yoke. So yoke is you, you bind together. So we breathe and we move at the same time. So just for a second, guys, since we've been sitting for a little bit, we get tight. Stand up and give yourself enough room to get your arms out to the side. And then let your arms hang down. My class knows this is anatomical position, right? Okay, no stress. So all you're going to do is you're going to inhale and bring your arms over your head real slow and then exhale and come out. Good, and we're going to do that four more times. Big breath in. And out. Three more. your shoulders, roll them up around your ears, feel better already? All right, now have a seat. Just get comfortable wherever you are. Uncross your legs if your legs are crossed. Relax your arms, they could be in your lap, they can be wherever you want them to be. Take a soft gaze. Maybe you want to look at the, at the stones, which are really cool. This is a way that people relax is to do this. Maybe you want to close your eyes. It doesn't matter to me. This is called visual imagery. I want you to imagine yourself in a place that you really love to go. Okay? Maybe it's the beach. Maybe it's at your house. Decide where you're going to go. Decide what time of year it is. Decide what time of day it is. Decide whether you're alone or you have somebody with you. And I want you to use your senses to see this place. See colors, see textures. You can focus on a big landscape or you can focus on one tiny little thing. But see your place. Keep taking big deep breaths in through your nose, out through the back of your throat. Now that you can see your place, I want you to think of the things you can hear. Maybe water and waves, maybe birds, children, wind. Listen to your place. What do you hear? What makes it special to you?
Next, think of what you feel. Do you feel sun on your back, or your face? Do you feel the warmth of a fire, mud squishing between your toes? Depends upon your place. What do you feel? And not just what you feel physically, but how does this place make you feel emotionally? Safe? Happy? Keep the deep breaths coming. Stay in your place and add to that what you smell. Smell is your strongest trigger of your memories. So does your place have a certain smell? Putting all that together, you see your place. You hear it. You feel it. You smell it. Slowly, we're going to begin to tap each finger to our thumb, one at a time. To let your body come back slowly to this room. You tapped all your fingers. Make a very gentle fist so you can feel your fingertips just touch your palms. Then open your fingers up wide, stretching them out and then let them relax. Taking a big, deep cleansing breath all the way in, as deep as you can. When we exhale, we're gonna open our mouth and just sigh, just go. Do that one more time, big breath in. Let it go. Good. Then slowly open your eyes if they're closed and remember that that place is your place and you can go back to that place anytime that you want. It took about five minutes. You feel better? Can you squeeze five minutes into your day? Probably. Yeah, so when the stress really comes, just take that time, breathe, practice that deep breathing. So when we breathe in real deep and we exhale real slow, this is the last thing I'll, I'll say used to tell my patients to pretend they were blowing bubbles. Because you know if you blow bubbles and you, you do the bubble wand, you go <laughs> then you get lots of little bubbles, right? But if you blow <sighs> you can blow a really big bubble, yeah? So we want to blow those really big bubbles. But we also want to keep our balance, okay? So we, you know, that's how we're going to relax, but we don't want to get too relaxed because we want a little bit, we want to stay sharp as well. But sometimes we need to dial back and relax. Yeah. I had a cardiac rehab patient. I said, who wants to share where they went? Anybody want to share where they went? No. He was an old country fella, little bitty guy. And he said, I remember when my mama used to send me and my sister down to the creek to get a toothbrush, to get a sassafras toothbrush. And I always thought that was just the sweetest memory I'd ever heard. So anyway, Hope you all feel better. I hope you got something out of it. I hope it didn't bore you too much. And um, I think I'm going to start balancing stones. Thank you, guys. <laughs>